Right, we should, be re we should be recording our call. So welcome to the second Open Life Science cohort call. Um, as a reminder, we have a code of conduct uh, in the HackMD. If you're looking um, and you have it in the edit mode, then you should be able to see a link to the code of conduct on line 114 right now. Oh, that, that may change if people add their names in uh, or your icebreakers. And as a general rule, this means that you need to treat one another with the respect that you would like to be treated uh, kindly, thoughtfully, and um, there's a lot more to it. So please do go click and read through that. Um, but if at any point you feel like you have either witnessed or experienced a violation of any kind, um, then you can report this. So there um, is reporting guidelines. You can either go to team at openlifesci.org. That reaches myself, uh, Malvika, and also Berenice Batu, the three um, Open Life Science uh, co-founders. But um, if for some reason you need to approach one of us directly, let's say, for example, if it was one of us who caused the <coughs> issue, then you can also email us directly. I'm just going to put everyone on mute very quickly. Uh, that just helps to make sure that we don't get any background noises coming in. Uh, no, I just unmuted all. That's exactly wrong. Right. Okay. Everyone except me should be muted now. Um, so this is just a quick sort of online um, etiquette thing. It's helpful to leave the phone on mute, not the phone, <laughs> the audio on mute. Um, and it's still fine to talk and just make sure to unmute and then remute when you're done. Um, just to make sure that we don't get any trucks driving by or um, cats yelling that it's time to feed me or whatever it may be. Um, so one other note is if you look at line one, two, three, there is also audio transcription and I'm just going to paste this in the chat as well because saying verbally that there is transcription will not work in some ways logically. Um, so that just means that if you want, if you're having trouble following along. <laughs> Thanks Jess. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm distracted now. Um, yes, so that you can follow along by reading what we're saying as well as also just listening. Um, so we have a, a new co-host who will be helping us out for the um, calls in the future. Uh, Emmy, can I get just get you to give us a quick wave and hi? Looking for the um, mute. Hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. Um, super happy to be joining Open Life Science. Um, really hoping to be learning from y'all um, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, please let me know if I don't make any sense when I co-host in the future, hopefully. <laughs> but I have great people to learn from, Yo, Malvika and Berenice. So yeah, glad to be here and excited to see what everyone's up to and everyone's thoughts. Thanks, Emmy. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, so um, when we were running OLS1, Emmy was actually running a very similar program through eLife. Um, but she's moved on to a new job now, so she's hopped over to help us uh, with our lesson instead, which uh, we are absolutely delighted about. So she is, is another fantastic open science uh, expert to be chatting with. Um, let me see. Okay, we have uh, introductions. So for anyone who um, wasn't able to make it to the last call, we'd love to give you a quick chance just to uh, introduce yourself. Uh, so right now, the introductions queue is on line 144. It's migrating. It's now 148. So if you haven't had a chance, please hop over there and feel free to add your name into the roll call. And I'm just going to work through in order. Uh, by the way, is there anything I've missed? Or are we good? Oh, okay. I have a head shake from Alvika. Brilliant. Okay. So in that case, um, I will ask just in like a couple of sentences, just share uh, who you are and what you do, why you're here. Um, and I will pass it on first of all to Danny. Uh, hi. Um, yeah. The, uh, the other time is, uh, is when I'm sleeping. So I, uh, I won't be going to those ones, but uh, so I'm really excited to be here for the first time. Um, I work in a, um, in a macaque neurophysiology lab in Washington, D.C. at the National Institutes of Health, technically in Maryland, but I live in Washington, D.C. Um, and my specialism is in colour science. I work out why and how uh, primates and other animals see colour. Um, super excited to be, to be here. Uh, yeah. Oh, project. Um, the uh, the experiment that I'm working on at the moment, we're trying to make it into a registered report, and registered reports aren't really a thing that happens in primate neurophysiology. Um, so we're trying to expand that into a kind of 
why is that not a thing? How can we make it be a thing? How, who do we talk to, to to work out why it's not a thing? Yeah, that's that's a broad introduction. Awesome, okay. Uh, next up, uh, wow, the lines have hopped away. Um, scrolled down. Okay, uh, Neha, and did I pronounce your name correctly? Hey everyone, um, it's pronounced Neha, so you're close enough. Uh, yeah, so hi everybody, I'm Neha. Um, well, I kind of um, fell into Open Life Science too, so it's super exciting, but it also just happened completely at random, so I'm just like, what, what is going on? Um, I'm going to be working on the um, embedding accessibility in the Turing Way um, project. I was started by another applicant, Pooja, but she unfortunately can't continue with it, but um, through some recommendations and pure luck, um, here I am, and I'm super excited to um, take over and help push this uh, project forward, along with Paul, who's going to introduce himself. Um, I work as a data manager at the Utrecht University Library that's in the Netherlands. And um, well, I've just been involved in open science just on and off, um, not so much as a researcher, well, as a researcher for a while, um, have a master's degree. But, uh, but now I just really help um, other researchers to just make their data as open and fair as possible, if you've heard about that. Uh, and yeah, I'm really excited to work on this project and also just improve my open leadership skills uh, along the way and to get to know you all better. I, I, like I said, I just kind of dropped in so I'm a bit like, I don't know what is what, but I hope to catch up with you all very soon. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, don't worry, I don't think even us, uh, the OLS co-founders know what's what sometimes, so it's all good. Uh, next up, I think we have Paul. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Paul. I'm currently a student at the University of Glasgow. I'm uh, studying data science and I turned in my thesis two days ago. So, um, <laughs> so far, I'm, I'm free. Um, so yeah, I haven't had a lot of experience with open source projects, um, but I'm working, I'm going to be working with ne ne Neha, Neha, right? I'm going to be working with Neha on the um, embedding accessibility in, turn, in the Turing Way project. And I'm hoping that through the OLS program, I'd be able to develop the leadership skills to be able to um, make the project as sustainable and successful as possible. Congratulations on turning your thesis in. You must Thank be you. so over the moon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um, Dave, David. Hey, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, the past two weeks, I was on a holiday in sunny Wales. And I do actually mean it was sunny in Wales. Um, so I'm a little bit behind. Um, I work in London at the Alan Turing Institute, um, where I work in research engineering as a research software engineer. Um, the project that brought me to OLS2 is Turing Data Stories, which is kind of data journalism. We're trying to teach, inspire, and you know get people to have a really good understanding of, of, of data and numbers and, and things like that. Um, and I'm here with on that with uh, Camilla, Sam and Kevin, both Kevin and Camilla are on the call. Sam sends his apologies, he can't make it. Glorious, thank you so much. Uh, Joyce. Hey, okay. <laughs> Hi, um, so I'm Joyce. Um, I am calling in from Zurich. Um, I am currently the program director of the Open Innovation and Life Sciences Association now. We, were, we are newly established in Switzerland <laughs> since last month. Um, and um, that's the project that I'm here for, uh, for this uh, Open Life Science II cohort um, program. And uh, what we do in um, Open Innovation and Life Sciences, or OILS for short, is we promote the practice of open science in early career researchers um, in the Zurich area for now, and hopefully for all of Switzerland later. Um, and then we do this by also teaching um, uh, the ECRs um, the tools of open science. And we do this through events mostly. Um, we've run a conference for the past three years now, 
and um, yeah, <laughs> and we're just we're keeping we're keeping strong and keeping going. And uh, my day job right now is I've actually moved out of academia um, completely uh, since May, I guess, and I'm a web developer um, at an architecture firm. So this is kind of like uh, oils is kind of like my my baby project, I guess, my project. <laughs> and I'm trying to set this up um, in a more sustainable way so that it, I can pass it on and it's sustainable through like other generations of scientists to come. And I'm doing this project with uh, Tina, maybe she can introduce herself next, <laughs> um, who is my operations director for OILS. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, Tina? Yeah, Christina or Tina, hi. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks Joyce for introducing me already. I'm um, also a freshly graduated uh, postdoc now because I also finished my PhD just recently at the University of Zurich. <laughs> um, I've been part of OILS um, for two years now and yeah, I think Joyce explained everything what we're doing right now and we're really happy to be part of this um, to enhance our skills and bringing everything further. Okay, brilliant. Uh, Samuel Burke. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, hi, I'm Sam. Um, I'm in uh, Montreal, Canada, and uh, I am, well, I'm jo I've, I've joined the awesome team, which is Open Science in Montreal, which was in the, the first cohort with, um, with Samuel G, <laughs> Samuel Gay. And um, what we're trying to do is really kind of develop an onboarding experience to open science uh, specifically for the francophone communities. Um, one of the things that we, we've noticed is um, lots, there's lots of open science information, especially in English, but there's big non-English speaking communities, especially like here in Quebec and in, and in France and in large parts of Africa. So it's really about um, offering similar resources, but in French to kind of get another large portion of the world uh, like on the on the open science boat um oh and um yeah i'm i'm doing a phd in neuroscience um i think i fell into the open science world like for many of the similar reasons as, as most people here and um one of the things which i'm kind of really interested in is getting scientists to actually do science it's one of the things that whether it's from basic statistics to to, uh, to check in that your data is normally distributed to all the other kind of communicated in a very open way. So I'm really hoping that, uh, well, I, I know that with the OLS, it's really going to help um, get, um, get people on board and get people contributing. So it becomes a self-sustaining uh, enterprise. All right, thanks. Fabulous. And I have to say that I'm just jealous that your, your project name is pronounced awesome. That is the best. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, Samuel Gay. I can't take the credit for that. <laughs> 10 points. And Danny, and Danny Collins, yeah. Amazing. Uh, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is uh, Stephen Kluzer. I am a newly assistant uh, professor of biology at Clay State University in Moore, Georgia. So I haven't had a lot of experience with open science. Uh, I did have, I do have some experience working with uh, do-it-yourself bio. Um, I'm part of a makerspace, which has a, a do-it-yourself bio lab in Decatur, Georgia. And uh, I became interested in uh, looking at ways that we can actually bring uh, science to people who don't have scientific degree getting them interested in be able to uh, work with bacteria, work with gene, uh, try to get them experience in building machines out of bacteria, uh, which is part of synthetic biology. And for me, uh, being an assistant professor of biology at a university that serves underrepresented group, it really made me think long and hard about what does accessibility mean? Uh, for my university, is it's like 7,000 students, right? So we don't have all these uh, journal subscriptions to research that uh, the big 70,000 student uh, universities have. So it, when I look at that, I see uh, financial restrictions, social economic restrictions. 
on knowledge that my students really need in order to be competitive for the next step of your career. So I think it's really greatly informed the way that I look at research as something, you know, science that really belongs to the people. So with that in mind, one of the things that I want to do is I'm working with the Public Domain Gazette to help identify the technologies that have expired patents and so forth, bring them into the public domain. And with my project, I want to be able to kind of build another kind of synthetic biology uh, cloning system, a chassis, and bacillus subtilis, a bacteria that uh, is very amenable for this type of work. And my hope is to be able to have it made with public domain technologies so that there are no financial or academic restriction whatsoever, so anyone who asks for it can get it. That's the overall goal of that. So um, it's going to be going to be a long process, but I think it's going to be it's going to be worth it. Um, just to have people involved in science. Thank you so much. Okay. Next up we have, uh, and I apologize because I'm not Francophone. Uh, is it Andrean? Is that, if I said that right? Yes, you said it very well. Um, yes, so uh, my name is Andrean Prou. So I, I live in Montreal. That's why I wasn't, I didn't attend the last call because it was like 4 a.m. Uh, but I'm glad to be here today. Um, so um, from Montreal, um, I am a master's student in psychology. My background is mainly in cognitive neuroscience. Uh, I got interested in open science, um, learning, learning about uh, the reproducibility crisis in some of, some of my classes. And also I participated in the BrainAct school, uh, which focused a lot on uh, open science practices. And uh, I kind of like looked at different communities that were uh, interested in open science in, uh, at the University of Montreal. And we have the OZIM, uh, which uh, was, uh, um, who that was like started uh, by Samuel Burke uh, in the last cohort. Uh, so he just described, he gave a pretty good overview of what OZIM is. Uh, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but uh, yeah. So I joined and now I'm part of uh, OZIM and also the uh, second court of OLS. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, uh, the last person I have on the list for now is Kendra. Uh, if anyone else hasn't introduced yourself, please do add yourself to the list um, while Kendra's speaking. Hi, I'm Kendra. Um, I'm also in Montreal, um, where the last cohort call was very early in the morning. Um, so my idea for OLS was to start something called Open Science Office Hours. Um, so uh, in my experience, a lot of grad students learn about open science tools or about reproducibility problems and such um, in like uh, short term experiences like hackathons or in Montreal, we hold the, the Brain Hack School, which was just mentioned every summer, which is like a, a four week summer school where people learn about different open science issues and open science tools and such. Um, but the, the, the problem that I've, I've found is that there's no uh, long-term support, like continuous support for students, especially for students who don't have people, like senior people in their lab who use these tools. So it, could be, it can be very hard, I know from my own experience in my master's, to try to use open tools if no one else in the lab is using them. So the idea is that we would hold regular office hours where students could come and ask questions about um, how to make their research more open or say they're using an open tool like, like GitHub or Docker, they could get help problem solving some, some things they're running into. So yeah, but it's completely, uh, I'm not used to, I, I'm used to like joining organizations that exist and helping. I'm not so used to starting something on my own. So that's kind of like scary for me. Um, yeah. Anyways, it's been great to hear the other projects. That's it for me. Fantastic. Um, yeah, starting, starting your own organizations can be terrifying, but you've got it. We're, we're confident with that much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I have next uh, Bakari. And again, did I say that right? Please, if I ever say names wrong, people correct me. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, my name is correct, thanks. Uh, so my name is Bakari. I'm 
I'm a PhD student at Rogi University in South Africa. I'm currently working on my PhD and I'm supposed to finish this year. And yeah, I'm currently busy, busy, busy. <laughs> so um, my background is in bioinformatics and I work in, in a drug discovery project. Um, so trying to find some chemical compounds and predict some activities for those compounds. That's what I, we are doing now. And I got invited to the project uh, by uh, a family member who is in Mali and currently we are working together on, on the project and it's about uh, trying to establish um, an electronic system for medical records in the, uh, uh, let's say the hospital system in Mali because they, everything is on paper and there is no like keeping track of um, the records and finding them, being able to search them in a database on, and having access to them. And that's a big problem and they get lost, they get um, people, they, they, they also privacy concern about it, but um, I think at, to some extent, they, there is a possibility to, to have medical records uh, in uh, electronic form. And also I got interested in open science because in open source in general, because working during my PhD, I've come across many uh, tools that I wanted to use. They were commercial ones, some were not open source, and that kind of break and pose a limit to your research and you can't really uh, do the things that the way you want it. And also I noticed that many people develop things tools freely, but they get lost in, in on the internet, on GitHub, and there are many good, small portion of code, but there is no like initiative to bring things together and maybe make something beautiful out of small contribution from different people. And I think we can really develop a uh, very cool tools from that perspective also. Yeah, so that's about it, thanks. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who hasn't had the chance to introduce themselves who would like to um... Say hi. Hi, I haven't introduced myself yet. Um, I'm Ava and I'm based in Zurich in Switzerland and our project, so my um, other project leader, he couldn't make it today, but his name is Dylan and we're working on trying to make an online platform for sharing workflows for finite element modeling. So that's kind of our part of um, our methodology for our research. So essentially you build 3D models and then you can apply a force to a model and then see how it distributes through the region of interest. So we're biomechanists and paleontologists. So we use this technique to look at how um, extinct fossils might have um, been using their jaw muscles to feed, but other people use it for various different biomechanical modeling um, techniques. But there are a lot of different programs and it's very, each group is kind of insulated in their own workflow and there's not a lot of online information if you wanted to get started or if you wanted to move to more open source software. So we're having a conference that'll probably be mostly online in March. And then from the conference when you're planning it, we thought it'd be a great idea to expand this and make it an online hub where researchers can share the modeling workflows and then other people can read them and get started learning these techniques. Fantastic, thank you, Eva. Uh, is there anyone else? Hey, Kayoma, are you speaking? I, I think you're on mute. Still on mute, sorry. It's not on mute on Zoom though. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the it audio is not coming yet. through. Maybe Kayoma, can you uh, write on the chat and one of us will read it up for the group. All right. Oh. Yeah. You. you can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Ekoma Festos. Um, I have a background in biomedical sciences and I'm in South Africa, UWC, the University of Western Cape. Uh, I got, uh, I don't have any experience with open, um, uh, Open source is my first time. Everything's just so, so new to me. <laughs> Trying to understand the assignment, struggling with it, created my canvas. It's not been easy, but I'm excited to, to be part of it, to uh, work together with uh, 
researchers, genetic researchers. I uh, will be working with SAMBI, South African uh, Institute of uh, Biodiversity. I uh, will be looking into precision medicine, how we could uh, type uh, uh, medicine, particularly to a set of individuals, because we believe that um, in genetics, not one cap fits everybody. Everybody have different kind of genetic makeup and it affects the way we metabolize uh, uh, drugs and whatever. So it is good we type uh, individual uh, reactions to a particular drug and understand what is going on. So that's going to be my project and I'm going to be working under Sunbi. Thank you. Fabulous. And I'm glad that we managed to get the audio working. <laughs> uh, is there anybody else that we've missed? Hi. Hey. I can't can you hear me? Yes, we can. So, hi, I'm Taina. I'm a biologist and now I'm in I'm a fellow postdoc in the Botanical Garden of Rio de Janeiro. And I'm working with open data and tools of biodiversity, mainly to improve conservation actions. And here I'm working with land use, land cover data in ITCDF format. And I want to make it available in other common formats and learn more about good practices in open, open science. So thank you for this opportunity. Fabulous. Okay, anyone else? So I don't know if the last time I had three pages worth of people on my Zoom. I love it. Um, okay, if there's anyone that we missed, um, please like just feel free to poke me, but I'm going to move on. Um, so we are going to move on next to a breakout room. And so this is basically where we share some of our experiences where stuff went well or when, when stuff went less well, your open experiences. Um, so the, the, this is looking at line 207 right now uh, and so there's two things to think of we'll give you about 10 minutes and about three people per room uh, and this will be uh, asking you to think of a time when something was a complete train wreck in an open project and if you don't have personal experiences maybe this is something you've witnessed or heard about and also think about a time when you were working or collaborating on a project and everything was perfect um, so yeah, those two things over about 10 minutes in groups of roughly three. And I, th I think we probably also want to make sure that there will be at this time so some groups. Uh, so, oh, actually, I don't know if I've mentioned breakout rooms. I should very briefly introduce those as well. Um, so we will just break up into smaller like sub video calls for about 10 minutes. There should be a timer on your screen, hopefully that'll tell you when you're coming back. Um, and then you'll be just transported off into your own rooms. If you ever need any help at any point, uh, then on the bottom of your Zoom, you should have an option to, I think, ask for help and that will transport one of the hosts into your room to chat and see what's going on. Uh, but I think we might also, we won't have the Otter live transcription in the breakout rooms, I don't think. So we probably want to have some of the breakout rooms also be uh, non-verbal, where you just type through the chat rather than actually using the verbal discussions as well. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly create the breakout rooms. Um, before I send you off, it'll be just a second. More breakout rooms. Um, okay, right. Uh, so, uh, for breakout rooms, sorry, just a second. This, I'm not used to having quite so many people. Okay, breakout rooms 10, 11, 12, and 13. I'm going to suggest try try doing the break, the breakouts non-verbally. So just try using chat to have these discussions, uh, and also try and make notes in the HackMD to see how that goes. Uh, and the rest of you, uh, breakout rooms are verbal. Clear? Good. Can I have some thumbs up if it is? Amazing! I love seeing thumbs up. Okay, right. We'll send you off ten minutes, and it starts any moment now. <laughs> Right, open all rooms. Sorry. 
hard. Okay, is so, everyone... So, so time I had everything go wrong was when I was busy baking in the middle of a call and making loads of background noise and you had to mute me. <laughs> oh, classic. <laughs> Oh dear, are we back yet? No, we're still popping back in. Sorry, by the way. <laughs> That's fine. We we got like a host power. As long as you don't mind being muted. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, we do need to know what you're baking though, Jess. Um. <laughs> Okay, um, let me see where we are. So we've had some great notes uh, coming in to the HackMD. Uh, so thank you everyone, especially the nonverbal rooms where the notes have just been coming in thick and strong. Um, so uh, I think in the name of time, we'll let you all read. I, I will ask anyone if you want to report out and add more notes into the uh, breakout room notes areas. We're looking at around line two, 130 or 40 at the moment for the breakout rooms uh, and please do add those in uh, and we will move on to our very first talk sorry my HackMD has completely frozen up <laughs> Malvika could I ask you to follow this on yeah absolutely so the intention we wanted you all to sit with each other and talk about positive and negative experiences because we believe that there is never a perfect or perfect or sublime experience or never a train wreck. There's always a little bit of tweaking you can do in building your project that from the beginning you're insured of uh, stopping your project from being ruined by these kind of negative experiences. But also think about that if something wrong comes up, how can you improve the next time? So what we have today is a series of uh, talks that we're gonna take you through. The first talk is on license, open license mostly, and our first speaker is Christine Rogers. I'll give it to Christine to talk about it, but you can also see the slides that she has shared in 284 line number. So Christine. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, oh, I think I need you to enable an attendee screen sharing. Can you do that? And can you guys hear me already? Okay. If my video or, a, or a sound starts to cut out, I have a have backup plan. So just let me know. Okay. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. This is a generic slide set that's part of the program for Open Life Science. So these are not my slides, but I'll do my best to represent here. Um, so this today is a background on open licenses, specifically for um, with information that might be helpful for your open life science projects. Disclaimer number one, I'm not a lawyer. Um, you'll hear that again during the talk. So I'm going to keep going if everything's okay. Audio, video. Okay, great. So I'm Christine Rogers. I see a few people who know me already on this call. So shout out to my Montreal uh, people like Kendra and Sam Gay's crew. I'm part of that open science uh, ecosystem based in Montreal. Personally, I'm at McGill University at the Montreal Neurological Institute, which is the largest academic open science research institute going. And specifically, I'm a data manager, research, research project officer, on a number of open science projects and initiatives because I work for the LORIS uh, databasing group. We make an open source uh, platform that's basically uh, data tools, databasing, data sharing um, for neuroscience research and is also used in a lot of open science initiatives. So that's my context. Um, I've also been a part of the open life science cohort that started in January. I'm very happy to be back. And I focused in that um, phase on adoptability metrics and support for open source research software. I'm also involved in some of Google's open source programs in terms of mentoring for Google Summer of Code and Google Season of Docs this fall. And if anyone wants to connect on with me, you can reach me on Twitter. My handle is at the bottom of the slide and I will take it from there. So today we're talking about licensing. The purpose of the presentation um, 
for the context of the open life science program is that licenses are going to allow you and anyone to use remix and share what you're doing on your project the outcome of today and under the exercises you're going through today is that your project is going to be openly licensed for use for remixing and for sharing today we're doing a short presentation followed by discussion with some practical steps to help you work towards adding an open license to your work uh, the steps are really simple the thinking behind it is worth taking a moment to go over so that's the plan for today am i still good on the audio visual front okay great uh i just have to figure out what to click uh oh there we go yeah okay so how does this fit into the open leadership framework let's start there uh the context of the open leadership framework is that open leaders will design and build projects that empower others to collaborate within inclusive communities and with licensing when you think of licensing you don't necessarily think of empowering you think of restricting um, I think is in terms of everyone's experience with user licenses would be a really familiar example. For example, a lot of people know MATLAB in terms of the context that it's available free for use for academia. But if you're trying to use it in the context of company or privately, uh, suddenly the license costs a lot of money. So user licenses um, are one perspective. We're going to flip the script today because from your point of view as a creator, of a project, you're looking to add a license to your project that's going to tell others what they're free to do with your work, um, how they can share it, reproduce it, adapt it, and what their rights and obligations are in that respect. And that also gives you as the creator the protection of having um, those clearly in place, having that framework, uh, but at the same time being able to share what you've produced really openly once that is in place. So that's how licenses can be a powerful tool for sharing. And that's how they also fit into the grid for the open leadership framework under the category of build for sharing. Uh, licensing is something that really enables you to share your work uh, as you build out your project. Um, there's a few key aspects to licensing. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer, um, but we're going to continue on this basis with a bit of background. For truly open licenses, um, I think they all have the common elements about use, modification, and sharing of software. So use is just who can use the work and for what purpose, whether it's commercial or research only. Modification, can the work be modified? Who can modify it? For what purpose? And then sharing. So if if you make a modification to work, um, can you share what you produce with other people and how? And can you redistribute the original also? Uh, there's a definition of open source down below. And I'm going to avoid the debate on what open source is and is not today and skip ahead to what you guys need to know about licensing. So under those three common elements of truly open licensing, the first part where it's important to pay attention to how this impacts you is attribution. So most open licenses will require others to credit the authors or copyright holders of the work. That's a pretty common thing that a lot of people are used to. Examples are with the Creative Commons BY license and almost all of the other licenses. You need to attribute the work when you use it uh, to the original authors. This is really common if you use a photo, for example, you'll, you're going to want to credit the source. Um, there's also a type of license that says there's no attribution to be made, and that's a CC0 license, which says that something is effectively in the public domain and is actually no copyright holder. So moving on from attribution, the next important thing is distribution. So when you when you're distributing something that's the original or something that you've modified, what are your rights and obligations? So the two main types of uh, open licensing aspects are non-copyleft and copyleft. Starting with copyleft, this is a permissive non-reciprocal license. Uh, the important point is that it's an open license that does not require derivative works to be shared using the same license. Examples are the CC BY license, MIT, BSD, and the APL 2.0 license. 
On the other hand, you have copyleft licenses. These are reciprocal or viral licenses. And the idea is that an open license, it's an open license that requires all derivative works to be shared with the same license. So anything downstream of the original uh, code or product needs to be shared using the same license. So in that sense, you're restricted to the same conditions. So examples of that are the CC by SA license, GPL v3, which is really common in the Unix community, and, uh, or Linux community, I should say, um, and MPL 2.0. So just a bit more context about these two aspects. What does it mean to require derivative works to be shared with the same license or not? Um, in my context, we make an open source tool and we allow people to fork it freely, make their own adaptations, and then use that for their own purposes. But the moment that they want to share what they've done, features they've added, maybe domain specific um, tools or content in there, the moment they want to share that with, let's say, their colleagues in the same field or someone else, um, our license is a GPL3, which is a copyleft license, and it governs them. So we've effectively required them to contribute their modifications back to the community. And the idea with that is that um, anything open needs to stay open. So the good side is that the community benefits, that's the idea. Um, the downside to think about with copyleft is that it means that um, it might actually be a deterrent in some cases from letting people use it for private use because it, it can't go very far without them ob being obligated to openly share it. Uh, on the other hand, copyleft also has the benefit that, um, um, let me flip that statement, non-copyleft, some licenses actually enable people to take your work, make their own version, and technically they could actually sell that version that they modify. So that's something to keep in mind with non-copyleft licenses. There's many things to look at on both sides, but that's kind of the context in which these things are important. So moving on, um, for, in terms of patent clauses, most modern open source software licensings do contain a clause that is designed to prevent people from using patent law to take away open source rights that's called patent snapback and it means that the patent rights sort of by default revert to the person who released it. Examples of this are MPL, APL, and GPL v3. Sometimes this isn't applicable in older licenses like MIT and BSD, but I don't think that'll be a concern for people applying licenses here necessarily. Um, in terms of how to apply a license, it's actually very simple. If you're using GitHub, which I think this program still is as a default tool, then um, GitHub has a really easy, it's not even a workflow, it's like a prompt when you start a new project to add a license. As you can see from the slide, it's a drop down that you just select what kind of license you want to use. So couldn't be easier to actually apply it on your file. Um, and it's typically in a file called license or license.txt often in all caps, you can just stick it in the main directory of your project and GitHub will do that for you. So also in terms of how to apply a license, beyond just putting the file in your repository, there are specific instructions you need to follow on certain licenses. Details are available at those links, chooselicense.com, creativecommons.org. Those links will appear again on the last slide, so we'll come back to these resources. Um, also good to know is that you can have multiple licenses within a single project, some for content and some for the actual software part, just so long as you're clear about which goes on which, and that's typically done in the readme of your project. Um, details uh, on copyleft, non-copyleft, patent, snapback, older um, licenses with no patent clause versus Attribution and no attribution is broken down here in this table. Uh, there's, uh, you know, chooseaflicense.com is a great resource for choosing licenses for software. For content, people might gravitate towards the Creative Commons licensing. And then I'm going to put a big caveat at the bottom for data. Some people use CCO. I am not going to go into that today, but I just want to say, like, from my research context, 
data licensing and data sharing is very special and very tricky. There are a lot of considerations. Um, for some of you who might be doing a survey for your project, you might include, want to include participation uh, considerations such as participant consent and the ethics of data sharing if you're collecting data, whether the, your data can be used for commercial purposes or you just want it used for research purposes and what that means. So um, licensing data is a whole other field and I'll leave that sort of out of the scope of today's talk. Uh, if anyone's doing a hardware project just for fun on the side, hardware licenses are also another specialty. So those things are slightly out of the scope today, but uh, still definitely relevant domains. So coming to the end, here are some links for further reading. Um, there are some books, there are some guides, um, and one thing I would advise is that when you're choosing a license, don't go to the Wikipedia page. Uh, yo, this was the meme I was going to make for you. Don't go to the Wikipedia page. Do actually look around in your community that you're going to release your project into, whether that's the code or the, the program or framework or the data that you're, that you're um, working towards. What's the community um, that's going to use it and modify and adapt it and take it further? And what licensing is uh, the norm or common practice there? because you are also signaling uh, kind of like the values of your project through the licensing that you use and you want to use as much as possible a license that people are comfortable with and uh, conforms with the standards that, um, that, that are prevalent in the community that you're actually trying to attract and build with. Okay, and then at the bottom, choose a license. Um, Mozilla Open Leadership actually has its own page on licensing, so they have a nice summary there. And then those links again for choosealicense.com, which is kind of like choose your own adventure, explore licensing, and creativecommons.org are great resources for um, getting started on this licensing adventure. So I hope that helps with uh, covering some content for licensing. And that's my talk today. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, definitely invite some questions. Did I make it all the way through with sound and video okay? Yeah, okay, all right. Some things are going all right. Is there anything I can go back over or break so down? Next time? We have a question in the line number 319. Mm -hmm. If it's still, okay, it's around that. What is the difference between non-copyleft and copyright? So copyright, uh, again, I'm not an expert, I'm not a lawyer. Copyright is considered non-open, let's just say. Uh, copyright is about the protection of rights, all rights reserved, um, and generally it doesn't permit so much um, adaptation and redistribution of uh, a particular property uh, like software. Uh, copyleft and non-copyleft are more like under the umbrella of open licenses, where you know that you are going to permit adaptation, modification, and redistribution. The question is just how and what are the restrictions on that? Perfect. Thanks so much, Christine. I'll let people leave some questions there. And because we are massively behind time, let's thank Christine and move on to the next speaker. Thanks so much, Christine, for coming back to the call. My pleasure. So we have uh, our next speaker, Matthias Kosak, who's on the call. He's going to talk about README. Um, he was a previous mentor in the program and an expert in this uh, cohort. Should I start sharing? Yeah, perfect. Right. So you should now see my slide, at least the first slide. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I will be talking about the README's, uh, but First, uh, uh, I will introduce myself. My name is Mateusz Kuzak. I'm a community manager at the Netherlands Science Center. My background is life sciences, uh, cell biophysics, and bioinformatics. And uh, for a while, I've been a research software engineer. So I've been developing research software. And for a, while, for a while now, I'm the community manager in the area of research software engineering. So I usually help research software engineers connect to their communities and help them help them with their projects. 
Um, and I guess that's why I'm talking here about the readme files, because that's part of the uh, things. How do you interact uh, or make the interaction better with uh, the community uh, that is interested in your software? Or how do you make or get your community interested in your projects? Um, so uh, from this very short talk, we'll learn how to use the readme to communicate information about your project effectively. Uh, how to write clear description of the project, um, which is very important and it's uh, actually quite difficult, uh, despite what you might think. It's easy to um, not realize that we're using jargon or we're making things more complicated because of our background um, and that we know much more than other people uh, might do. And uh, we'll uh, show some examples, some good examples of readme files. Um, and I guess your assignment will be to uh, either revise or improve or start your readme file for your project. Um, so again, we have this uh, matrix of, uh, of uh, how, where things uh, are in the OLS project. So this is uh, part of build for understanding. It's about communicating things about your project. It's about facilitation collaboration. It's about facilitation maintenance and uh, helping with the project management. Um, so the readme is like a doormap for your project. It's the first thing that people will see when they go to GitHub, they go to your GitHub page of the project. That's what they see, the, the content of the, of the readme file. So this is like your unique opportunity to, get, to, to make a good impression. It's like the, the first impression where you make when you met, meet, meet someone first time. Uh, so this is when your potential contributors or users are going to meet your project. And that's why it's very important that they don't get discouraged uh, when they see it, but they actually get interested. So how, how can we make it happen? Um, but first, what actually is the readme? Um, the readme is it's a text file, usually. Um, it's, uh, it's found in the root directory of your repository. So um, all of you are working now on GitHub uh, with your projects. Uh, when you create a project, GitHub will automatically create a readme file for you based on the information that you provided when you created the project. So there will be a header, which will be a name of your project, and then there will be a short description, uh, the description that you put in when you created the project. Uh, so I guess you already started with the readme file. It's usually all in caps, so uh, all in caps readme, it could be readme.txt or readme.md, which stands for markdown. Um, markdown files are automatically rendered uh, on GitHub in a nice way and they give you more possibility to, uh, to add some design things in your readme uh, over the text files, simple uh, text files. Um, yeah, and as I already said, this is the first thing that people will see. Um, so what's in the readme? Um, it's a, a, there should be a description of what is your project about? Why is it important? Um, who is the audience of the project? What, what makes your project special or exciting? Like why people would, should get excited about it and how they can get started either to use it or collaborate with you or to contribute to the project uh, and where they can find the, the, the key resources to, to like start the journey with your project. Um, and you can use the open canvas to start your readme file. Uh, I will show some examples and examples of the things that you can add to make your readme uh, more effective. Uh, this is the example from the STEM role uh, models app. Um, and you see here, uh, there is the, in, in large letters, there's the name of the project. And then there is the vision of the project. We are really like, it's like the first thing you see is the, the name and the vision of the project. So it gives you the, already the perspective, what, what it is about. And then, there's, uh, there's this very welcoming message uh, and there are some links to more resources to find out, to learn more about the project. Um, usually you also have, so the, the name, the vision, the, the welcome message, project description, these are all the things that we need in the readme file. You can also add information how to contribute, how to get involved. Um, in the previous category, we already heard uh, it's a good place to put information about the license that is used, apart from having a license file. 
uh, and also information about the code of conduct and how to report um, violations because you want people who join to to know that there is a code of conduct and that this is the safe, safe place to interact with others. Um, what else? Uh, communicate the expectations around the readiness. Uh, it is important, not every project is ready from the start, uh, but you want to uh, make sure that you communicate it clearly what is the status of the project. Um, is it very early stage or is it ready for use? Um, communicate expectations for managing contributions, like what kind of contributions are you looking for? Um, are you like, what, what is the level of your time commitment? How much can you support the contributors to your project? Because maybe you don't have the, those resources and you can't spend, or you have limited resources, or you have uh, um, like specific ways that you would like to uh, collaborate with others. Um, that also means describe communication channels. And here's the example from the ReproHack uh, GitHub repository. So this is the, the hackathon, uh, which is focused on uh, trying to reproduce research papers. And you see here, first of all, there is this welcoming message. Uh, but also you see the repo status, uh, which is in this case is WIP, which is work in progress. So it emphasizes it's, it's still work in progress. But it also shows you how you can join the conversations by joining Slack, by pressing the button join, Slack join us. Uh, and you can also keep in touch and see what's happening by subscribing to the newsletter. Um, and uh, you might be already familiar with, uh, with badges. Uh, so uh, GitHub uses uh, those badges on readme files. These are very nice way, like colorful ways uh, of uh, communicating uh, various things that are, uh, about your project. There's a version of your uh, software if you have releases, the license, the quality of the code, uh, the documentation, testing, uh, does it have a continuous integration, things like that. Um, and then, yeah, you can uh, sprinkle it with uh, emojis. Uh, it would be more colorful. Uh, not everyone likes it, but if you if you like it, uh, that's also you can make it. I think it makes it a bit more friendly. Um, and sometimes you need to communicate something which is more complicated. You you want to show how to do something. You could use uh, animated uh, just for that. Mm. And as I already mentioned, is it's very easy uh, to uh, overcomplicate things in the readme file or make it difficult for others to understand uh, what the project is about because you have an expert blind spot, you know already much more about it. Um, and so uh, this is, um, so how, how can we make it easier? How, how can we make sure that it's easier and accessible for others? Um, you might have no, uh, heard about Randall Monroe. This is a person who uh, uh, draws XKCD comic or writes X, yeah, both writes and reads and uh, draws. Uh, and he wrote this book, uh, Things Explainer, when he, uh, uh, it's basically like a challenge how to describe uh, complicated stuff uh, in the word in simple words. So he used 10 hundred most common words in English language and he described different things. Like in this case, it's uh, Abgor 5. Uh, because the rocket is not uh, one of the 10 hundred uh, most uh, popular words. Um, and then there are tools that actually can help you do it. You can use the, um, there's the link here uh, to the AppGore 5. Uh, you can use the editor that will help you to write your readme file uh, using only those 10 hundred most uh, popular words. Um, and then there's the other editor that will help you also with, with accessible readme. It's uh, Hemingway app. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I don't know if you're, uh, you're, you're planning the exercise in breakouts with the readme files. So that's adequate. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's it for me. And please put in, uh, ah, yeah, there are more uh, resources. So if you want to look up some examples of readme files, they are here. Uh, and put in the hack, um, the ideas, uh, your ideas for good readme file. If you know something, if I didn't mention it's a lot of things that I haven't mentioned. So if you have, if you've seen some great readme files, you can put uh, examples there and ideas. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthews. As Matthews mentioned, we have a breakout room. You, you wanna 
so I have reduced the time because as you noticed, we had a longer introduction session. So we're gonna have a shorter breakout room with only two people. And in the last time we had non-verbal room and we'll continue that as well in this round. Okay, I'm going to send everyone off. Uh, much like before, some of the rooms are non-verbal. If your room has two digits, if it's 10, 11, 12 or 13, it's a non-verbal room. Uh, how long should I put on, sorry, Malvika? So two people, five minutes should be enough. Okay. Uh, yeah. right, the timer isn't going to work correctly because um, my computer is definitely playing up, but we will send you warnings. <laughs> and we're sending you off now. My slides are linked from the MarketMD because there was a question about the slides. Thanks, Matthew. It's 12 seconds. Okay, I'll just put the recording. We, we always realize 19 minutes just pass so quickly. It's real difficult to cover everything there. Okay, we should all be back now. Um, yeah, or... please take over, I've re recorded. Okay, okay, right. So thank you everyone for bearing with me while well, my computer was getting a bit stuck. And I hope you didn't have too, um, I hope it wasn't too short a breakout room. We recognize it was a breakout room, but we're very, very, very good at running over time with uh, these cohort calls. So uh, I can see a bunch of amazing, amazing um, UPGO5, including some that seem to involve uh oh profanity or something like that. <laughs> uh, or it could be um, just more technical words. Uh, so our next call is, uh, sorry, our next speaker is Lily Winfrey, who will be speaking no, about contributions. 20 minutes or so, 20 minutes. Sorry? Ah, may have, may have been a mute, mute blip. <laughs> uh, Lily, uh, can we get you to share about contribution guidelines and code of conduct? Yes, definitely. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, let me open up the slides and I will start presenting. Oh, first I need to share my screen. Okay. Here we go. Now, of course, mine is being slow. Loading, but oh, looking good. Hey, I know it's so so slow. All right. So I am also using slides that were given to me. However, I decided to make some edits to add a few different pictures, so they're slightly different than they originally were. Um, but I am here to talk to you about creating a positive culture for contribution and collaborations for your open projects. And we will specifically be looking at making a contributing guide and a code of conduct. So let's get going and we'll try to do this quickly. So I am Lily and I'm a product manager for the Frictionless Data Project, which is an open source project. And I work at the Open Knowledge Foundation. And you can also follow me on Twitter. So what is a project's culture? The culture is very important to think about when you're working on an open project because it isn't just you that's working on this project. Ideally, you want to be creating a community. And we just heard a little bit about this, like why you would be creating a README document. Part of that is to help build up your community. And a healthy project culture has a healthy community, meaning it has diverse members that um, you know, have different backgrounds and ideas and talents that can help build your community. So to help build and guide your culture, there's a few things you need to keep in mind. One is that it's a conscious decision that you as a leader need to make. And what I mean by that is that a culture will build itself within your project regardless of whether or not you build it it's like it will still happen but for it to be the culture that you want to build you need to make some decisions and help it build according to your values so you need to identify what your values are and that includes things like how should people behave that are part of this okay 
here is a picture example of um, things to think about for your project culture. So this is an XKCD. We were also just talking about, um, can I load it up on your laptop? Sure. Oh, just hit both shift keys to change over to QWERTY. Caps lock is control, space bar is caps lock, and two finger scroll means through time instead of space. And dot, 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 with the subtitle saying, once I've used a computer for a while, no one else will ever use it again. And this is showing you that the choices that you make determine who can or can't also use your project. So a project culture is more than just its goals. It's also things like the language, um, a shared set of norms, your expectations and your people's expectations, the tools that you choose to use, and things like how decisions are made and the project's identity. Okay, so how can you build your project's culture? Two ways we're gonna talk about today are using clear contributor guidelines and a code of conduct that importantly is enforceable. So what is a community? This image was on these slides and I thought it was so cute and I really like it because it shows that, you know, a community is about different, well, animals here, but different people, different users and how they all interact together. And maybe, you know, one part of the community is the base, like the thing that's keeping everyone warm, but there are other members of the community that also have different goals and they have different reasons for being part of the community. So it's important to understand why people are part of the community and what they gain from it and what they can give. What is contribution? Contribution is a vital part of teamwork and the contributions come in many different forms. And we'll talk about those a little bit here, um, but they can be like writing code, writing documentation, editing, giving ideas, project management. There's all sorts of things that team members can do to help the team as a whole. On GitHub, there are several ways you can look at contributors and contributors is a specific term that GitHub uses. And for instance, this is from the Frictionless Data Project. I work on one of our repositories. We have 23 contributors. So on your GitHub projects, you will also see how many contributors you have. So a good way that everyone, all of your projects should have a contributing document. And you can do this on GitHub. It's called a contributing.md. So it's a markdown document. And here's an example of one from one of our repositories. And so it has some general guidelines and this specific document goes on for a long time, but it tells you in all potential users how they can help. So it gives you instructions for like how to write the code according to um, the style guide. And it also tells you things like the language that um, is most commonly used and it can give tips for beginners and it will tell you things like, you know, this is the software that we use and here's where you can go to find help. So everyone should create a contributing.md file and there are, I think there's lots of examples, um, I think in the notes as well for these. Okay, so why and what? Contributing.md tells you um, the structure of contributions. It provides guidelines in a standard style. And it's also used to improve efficiency so people don't have to ask the leader over and over again, you know, how can I contribute? You can point them to this guide. And it's a great way to involve new people and build up your community. There are different people that you need to consider when making this contributors guide. So the owners, which would be, you know, most of you owners of the um, organization or project, all of the contributors, which are all members that have done something to help, and then the consumers or the users of the project. And, you know, sometimes people will fall in all three of these categories. Okay, you can also create a contributors or community page on your website if you have a project website that's different from the GitHub. And this is a nice example from the Carpentries. And I'll just leave that there for um, you guys to look through later, but it has a lot of great detail. All right, 
So now we're going to talk about code of conduct and why it's important to have a code of conduct. And um, we talked about this a little bit already, but your project re re will really flourish with a diverse community. But, oh, I skipped one. Hold on, I skipped a few. Oh, no, I think I'm just going in the opposite direction. Okay, but what if something happens? <laughs> if something happens, you need to have a code of conduct. A code of conduct is a set of rules that outline the social norms, rules, and responsibilities of an individual project, party, or organization, and it's commonly abbreviated as a COC. So a lot of people ask, do you really need a COC? Yes is the short answer, but why? Uh, a code of conduct invites people to your project. It sets clear expectations for your community members, and it tells contributors that you care about your community and that you care about creating a welcoming space for everyone. Here are some links to some examples of code of conduct, and I especially like the PyCon code of conduct. It is the most thorough code of conduct that I think I've ever seen. And I reference it all of the time. So I really recommend the PyCon code of conduct. Here's an example from the CSV con code of conduct, which I helped write this well earlier in this year when we went to a virtual conference. And it has a lot of um, the basic parts of the code of conduct. It outlines who the code of conduct is for, what kind of behavior is expected, what kind of behavior is not allowed, and importantly, the enforcement and reporting that would occur if there's a breach of the code of conduct. So a code of conduct is not just a box checking item. And a lot of people will create one and say, oh, we're done, but you actually aren't done. It's really important to make sure that your code of conduct has both enforcement and reporting included in, and you need to have specific ways that it's clear to people how they can report and who they are reporting to. And many of you probably heard this. I think Yo was mentioning the code of conduct earlier and went through a lot of details. So, you know, the open life side, Code of conduct is also a great example. Okay, so getting started, how do you start with your code of conduct? You should brainstorm some core words that represent your community values. And then think about behaviors that you want to encourage or discourage. Think through the process for incidents and complaints. And then also think about the consequences for people that act outside of these norms that are defined. And of course, you have to understand and accept your role as a project lead. And if you are uncomfortable or unsure about how to um, deal with reports, reach out to your community and ask for help and support. So tips and takeaways. Encourage and reward good practice. Designate a code of conduct and safety committee to help you with this. Make sure your code of conduct is posted, visible, and clear and communicated to your contributors and use an existing code of conduct. Many of them are openly licensed, which you just learned about, and you can reuse them. All right, I think that's it. So now it's time for some discussion about um, what are your tips and tricks. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing and thank you all. I think there's room in the agenda to write some things. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Lily. Uh, and we are a few minutes over time. So thank you everyone who has uh, patiently hung around. That's not Lily's fault and it definitely is more myself and Malvika. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you so much, Lily, you did great. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so if anyone wants to hang around, uh, I know we have a couple of questions, but if you need to get off, uh, head off, um, as usual at the bottom of the Hack MD, uh, that's why I'm looking over here, by the way, my computer is down here, my other computer, because this one's going so slow. Um, but there is some feedback at the very bottom of the Hack MD, just if you want to share how the call went, if you have any comments. Uh, I think we also have some homework assignments, uh, which you can see. 
uh, creating a GitHub repository, repository for your project, uh, adding links to your issues and start doing things like working on your readme based on what you've learned in the call today. Um, and remember, if you get stuck on those, you can always speak with your mentor and they can provide advice and guidance for the bits that you're less sure about. And you can also ask in the Slack because uh, some people are uh, more experienced with GitHub and may be able to offer advice as well, even if they're also OLS2 participants. Um, I've gone through and tried to answer some of the licensing questions we had towards the top of the document and we will go through and look for any more questions that you may have added. Um, only other thing that I note at the minute is that if uh, GitHub is frightening you, uh, that's okay. <laughs> um, everyone starts with GitHub at some point and we will try and help you out with this. So next week there is an optional call. Uh, so if you are comfortable with GitHub and you're not, not worried about it, feel free to skip or feel free to come along. Um, but if you'd like some advice on GitHub, then come along and we will spend some time going through GitHub in more detail, using it and creating files uh, so that everyone gets a chance to ask questions and to learn a bit more about it. Um, and then the next official cohort call is in two weeks and it will be another one of the early calls. Uh, so we will see some of you, but for others of you, it might be a bit night um, or mid middle of the early morning. -y. Uh, have I missed anything, Malvika? No, it's all perfect. Just again, a reminder, if you missed in all these, you can leave the call if you have to, but we will hang around for another 10 minutes to discuss any questions that might have come from the cohort call. So don't be shy and you, you don't need to definitely stick around if it's too late for you. Okay, it's lovely to have you all here and we'll see some of you next week or the week after. Okay, and so those who are sticking around and if you have any particular question about code of conduct, uh, read me file or licenses, uh, we're happy to help you answer some of those. And I think I'll stop recording so you can take your camera on and raise your hand and we can just have open discussion.